<laughs> okay, okay, welcome everybody. My name is uh, Charles Lane. I work at Ferris Science Limited. Uh, and today we have an excellent uh, webinar on uh, the subject of Xylella fastidiosa, uh, which as I'm sure you may have heard about is uh, yeah. certainly hit the headlines. Fortuitously, it's not in this country. Um, and I think that's down to good uh, plant health regulations. It's also down to good surveillance as well. I think it's important to remember it's not one of the observatory priority pests and diseases at the moment um, because as you'll find as we go through the talk, the symptoms are phenomenally difficult to discriminate um, from many other uh, problems. But we have done some citizen science with Zylella looking for vectors. So we thought as uh, Tree Health Citizen Science it was really important for you guys to be up to speed to understand what some of the issues are and get some of the background information. Um, so we've got uh, two speakers today. We're going to start off with uh, Andrew Aspin, who's from Ferroscience, and then we're going to go down to Alice Holt and listen to Anna Perez Sierra, uh, who will talk about some of the uh, tree health related issues. Um, we also have Jeanette Alexander from Ferro in York with me today, and we've got Lucy Turner and uh, Susie down in Alice Holt as well. So we've got a really good mix of people. Uh, thanks for all phoning in. We're going to take questions at the end of the two presentations, if that's all right. Um, so if you can hold your questions till the end, that would be great. So I'll just hand over to Andy to start the presentations. Uh, yes, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Andy Aspin. Um, uh, we're doing this talk blind at the moment, so I'll be saying next slide quite often. So hopefully we'll be on to the first slide by now, which says uh, xylem inhabiting fastidious, uh, fastidious bacteria at the top of it. Um, so in the first part of the talk, I'll provide a general overview of the bacterium, its vectors and hosts, and a brief history of the diseases it causes. In the second part, Anna will provide a more detailed view of the situation in Europe and the symptoms that have been recorded on many hosts around the world. Xylella fastidiosa inhabits the xylem vessels of stems and leaves of a vast range of host plants, and there is also some evidence that the bacterium can be found in the roots of some hosts. The xylem vessels are ultimately blocked by bacterial aggregates and by tyloses and gums formed by the plant, eventually killing the affected plant. Bacterium also secretes hydrolytic enzymes that exacerbate the scorch symptoms. Xylella fastidiosa is very slow growing and has fastidious nutritional requirements, which makes isolation very difficult. On the next slide, you should be able to see some Xylella fastidiosa all lined up in rows. Xylella fastidiosa is found in only in the xylem vessels of plants. As can be seen in this electron micrograph, the bacterium has sticky ends, which are created through the production of molecules called adhesins. The bacteria stick together and form biofilms, both in the xylem of the plant and in the <coughs> foregut of the vector. On the next slide, there are some vectors. I'm not an entomologist, so I'll stick to the common insect names. In the Americas, the primary vectors are the glassy winged shark shooter, which is on the top left there, and the blue-green sharpshooter at the bottom left. These, these vectors don't occur in Europe. In Europe, the main vector is the common meadow spittle bug, or frog hopper, seen here on the right. You'll recognize the juveniles as cuckoo spit. The thing they have in common is that they feed on the xylem of plants. And on the next slide, you can see that meadow spittle bugs come in various shades. This one is quite light compared to the one on the previous slide. There are approximately 20 polymorphs, <coughs> but the bugs are usually a dull yellow through to a near black with a variety of markings. They're only about six millimeters long and feed on a wide variety of plants, including trees, but their preferred foods are grasses and reeds. So in the next slide, um, we have a bit more detail about the bacterium. Vectors are required to spread the bacterium. It's not a seedborne or mechanically transmitted disease. The optimum growth temperature of the bacterium is quite high for a bacterial plant pathogen at around 27 degrees centigrade, and, does not, and it does not toler tolerate very cold temperatures. The host range is vast. In tests made during the 1940s in California, 75 of 100 tested plant species proved to be hosts from which vectors could acquire the pathogen by feeding. Since then, many more hosts have been identified. 
but most of these hosts don't show symptoms or only exhibit very mild or slight stunting. In the next slide, you see some of the um, diseases that are caused by LFS DDA. <coughs> the first to be described was Pierce's disease, which was first observed in 1884 on grapevines near Anaheim in California and described by Newton B. Pierce, who was California's first professional plant pathologist. Uh, and he described that in 1892, where it was originally known as Anaheim disease. Although vectors were known to spread the disease, the cause remained unknown until 1977 when a bacterium associated with the xylem vessels of symptomatic plants was observed that caused symptoms when inoculated into grapevines. In 1987, Xylella fastidiosa was formally named and by this time it had been established that similar organisms were responsible for phony disease of peach, wilt of Madagascar periwinkle, stunting of ragweed and leaf scorches of almond, Japanese plum, elm, sycamore, oak, mulberry and maple in the US and citrus variegated chlorosis in Brazil. The thing to remember is that nearly all these diseases do not have very distinct or characteristic symptoms. Leaf scorch can be caused by a number of biotic and abiotic factors and citrus variegated chlorosis, which is the top right picture, looks very similar to zinc deficiency. So, Xylella fastidiosa is split into different subspecies, and that's on the next slide. It's a member of the family of Xanthomonidaceae, of the gamma proteobacteria. The genus Xylella contains two species, Xylella fastidiosa and Xylella taiwanensis. But Xylella taiwanensis has only been reported as causing pear leaf scorch in Taiwan. There are three widely accepted subspecies of of Xylella fastidiosa. These are subspecies fastidiosa, subspecies pauca, and subspecies multiplex. And hopefully a red arrow should now appear next to Xylella fastidia subspecies multiplex. <laughs> Although only subspecies fastidiosa and multiplex are considered valid <laughs> names by the body that names bacterial plant pathogens. Other Xylella fastidiosa species have been proposed, including subspecies Sandii, found on Nerium oleander, and more recently, subspecies Morus, found on Mulberry. On the next slide, we can see some the distribution. And although originating in North, Central, and the South Americas, Xylella fastidiosa has been found in other countries, including Taiwan. Not to be confused with the native Xylella taiwanensis on pears, Xylella fastidiosa has also been found on grapevines in Taiwan. And there have also been reports of Xylella fastidiosa causing symptoms on grapevines and in almond orchards in Iran. Narrowing down to the European scale on the next slide, hopefully there should be some information about uh, the outbreak in it. The first symptoms of olive quick decline syndrome were observed in the Salento Peninsula on the southeastern tip of Italy, and in 2013 the disease causing organism was identified as Xylella fastidiosa, subspecies pauca. Later, it was found to be molecularly identical to a strain isolated from oleander in Costa Rica. Further host plant species were identified in Apulia, including oleander and the ornamental plant Polygala myrtifolia used as an amenity plant across southern Europe. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, in France, hopefully the information about France is coming up, in 2015, uh, they reported that they have found Xylella fastidiosa in Corsica, predominantly on Polygala myrtifolia, and in later surveys in the south coastal regions of the mainland. These outbreaks were identified as Xylella fastidiosa subspecies multiplex, with the exception of a single finding next to the Italian border, which was the same as the subspecies in southern Italy. Worryingly, though, it appeared that in Corsica and on mainland France, there had been multiple introductions of the disease as multiple strains were identified. Um, the story in Germany, which should be the next piece of information, in June 2016, German is 
notified the EU Commission of an isolated finding of Xylella fastidiosa subspecies fastidiosa in a potted plant of oleander located in a greenhouse on a small nursery in Saxony. Xylella fastidiosa subspecies fastidiosa was detected on the nursery in other potted plants such as rosemary and other ornamental plants. All the plants in the nursery were destroyed and intensive surveillance in the zone around the greenhouse confirmed the absence of any other infected plants. So it's been eradicated from Germany. And moving on to the story in Spain, in the Balearics, in October 2016, the Spanish authorities notified the commission of the first outbreak of Xylella fastidiosa subspecies fastidiosa in Mallorca on three cherry trees in a garden centre. Since then, a number of further outbreaks have been detected in the Balearic Islands caused by different subspecies. There are Xylella fastidiosa subspecies multiplex in Mallorca and Menorca, and Xylella fastidiosa subspecies palca in Ibiza. Wild and cultivated olive trees, vines and almond trees are the main host plants here. And finally, on the 30th of June 2017, the Spanish authorities notified the Commission of the presence of Xylella fastidiosa subspecies multiplex in the province of Alicante. Almond is, the most ho Almond is the main host on the mainland, although positive cases have been also been recently reported on other host plants. And on the 10th of April 2018, the Spanish authorities also notified the Commission of the presence of Xylella fastidiosa subspecies multiplex on one olive plant in an open field near Madrid. Now I'm going to hand you over to my colleague Anna now, down in Alice Holt, who will be to tell you a little bit more about the situation in Europe and have a closer look at some of the symptoms. <coughs> Thank you. And um, we I'm going to start um with the first finding in Europe, uh, in Italy. Um it was first supported in, in two thousand and thirteen and surprisingly Olive, uh, has, it was not mentioned as one of the main uh, hosts uh, in the literature. There were some studies in Southern California um, where they reported some mortality of olive trees, uh, but although Xylella fastidiosa was consistently uh, detected in these olive trees and they showed the branch dieback and the leaf scorching, when they tried to do the pathogenicity test to prove that it was a pathogen, they, cannot, they could not be uh, proof. Then, as I said, when uh, this, this syndrome started in Italy, uh, they call it Olive Quick Decline Syndrome, and it started, as I said, in 2013 in southern Italy. Initially, the investigations, they show that symptomatic trees were infected by a complex of uh, pest and plant pathogens, and they found Cidella fastidiosa, but they also found several pathogenic fungi and then some uh, pests. Uh, the, the symptoms they could observe, they were withering and dissipation of the terminal shoots, and this rapidly spread to the rest of the canopy, and eventually the whole tree will collapse and, uh, and will die. Um, if we go to the next slide, we have a, a series of photographs where we can see some of the symptoms. If you look to the top uh, left, you will have uh, a row of uh, olive trees, and you can see the brown uh, patches of foliage. And then if you have a, a look to the picture on the right-hand corner at the top, you will see that the leaves, they show some um, necro uh, basically necrosis, and some of the leaves, you can see that half of the leaf is brown and half is green. And this is quite, quite characteristic uh, to have half of the it's the leaf will die and the rest of the leaf will remain green. The other two pictures at the bottom of the slide, it just show the um, effect or the symptoms on, on the olive growth and uh, how um, the trees die. We have some pictures just to, to show the before and after. These pictures were provided by our colleagues in Italy just to show uh, where they observe the, the, the symptoms and uh, how quick the disease can develop. And you can see, for example, on the top picture, um, these were t taken in October 2000, uh, 2010, and in 2013, you could see 
I don't know. Can you see the pointer moving mm -hmm. here? Okay, cool. No yeah. problem. Okay. Let's see. Yeah. Okay. You can see here, obviously, these are the trees, and you can see that in three years, the decline. Down here, the same. You can see this tree. In 2013, this olive tree are in the same tree three years later in April 2016. Again, this is to show, uh, these are different cases of olive trees and the decline, just to show how quick it happens. Uh, the picture on your left showing April 2014 and in June 2015, you can see how here you only have this brown and dying back of the branches and obviously eventually the whole tree will, will die. It's not only affecting uh, jungle or, mat or any mature trees. You can also see in these pictures that it can affect very mature old trees, as you can see here. In March 2015, only a few symptoms were observed in this tree. They are, um, you can see them in these circles here. Just a little bit of browning on the leaves. That was in March 2015. In September, 2015, you could see already some dieback of the branches here. You can see some uh, clear areas in the canopy and May 2016. Um, that is, was on olive. Um, in uh, France, uh, the main um, host affected uh, was polygala myrtifolia. And this is just, is polygala is so susceptible, they, they kind of use it as a sentinel plant. Then when you have silella, if you have silella in one area, if you have polygala, probably this will be the first plant you will see the symptoms. Uh, polygala multifolia is a, a plant that is common on Mediterranean countries, but it's used as an ornamental. It's got lovely a purple flowers. It's just very, very nice, and it's used along the roads um, as a hedge because it, when it's in flower, it looks really beautiful. But you can see the symptoms here, and again, you can see the leaf necrosis uh, is starting from the tips and just going halfway through to the leaf and then green, and eventually will end up killing the whole leaf, the twigs, and the branches, and you can see on the right hand uh, picture. Another one of the common hosts is uh, Nerium oleanda, oleanda. And in this case, the symptoms are also quite distinctive because you have the marginal necrosis along the sides of the leaf, and it's quite, uh, in, it's quite different from other necrosis. You can see the lateral necrosis and also from the tip. These are some of the most common hosts. But I'm going to I'm just going to, to go through um, what kind of symptoms are, are we expecting on urban trees and uh, what is the situation on trees, because this is probably what we may be expecting to see in, on our trees is, if they were infected. And Cidella fastidiosa on, uh, is being a disease described on, on urban trees in America. It's a common disease. They call it bacterial leaf scorch. You may find it as BLS. Uh, as a, for, for the disease, and the disease is, uh, is recognized as a major disease on the street and landscape trees uh, in, in the state, and the symptoms are not always very distinct, and that is one of the reasons why this was not included as one of the priority uh, pest and diseases, because as you are going to see now, the symptoms are they can be confused with senescence or with the drought, and it, it, you are going to see they are not easy to recognize, although they are very distinct. That doesn't make any sense. Um, then, for example, on oak, on Kirkus palustris, the disease appears as an early senescence, and it's not a clear, distinct pattern of necrosis. Then on other trees, as I'm going to show you the pictures, you can see the symptoms clearly. The first report of Silella on tree was on American elm, and elm um, actually is one of the most susceptible trees, and the, one of the few trees that probably, if it got Silella, uh, it will die for, because of the disease. 
but really since the 1980s, it's been reported on different hosts, and I'm going to go through the hosts that they are probably that we are more worried about in this country, and these are oaks, uh, plane trees, and acers. Then the disease has been reported on red oak and other oak species, and you can see the different species uh, that where it has been reported. And it's been reported on, on sycamore. Um, this is American sycamore, but it's really our plane tree, uh, Platanus occidentalis, and also on uh, maples. Then what are the symptoms? <laughs> the symptoms are, uh, this is on, on elm trees, and you can see here uh, is some of the yellowing and some of the leaf necrosis. I'm going to have a close-up in the next slide where you can see. And these are the symptoms we are expecting on trees. And are the same for every single tree. Then I'm going to repeat myself in every slide. Sorry because of, of this. But basically, you have a marginal necrosis on the leaf, as you can see on the image here. And I'm going, you can see the marginal necrosis. And this, you will have, in many occasions, this yellow halo around the necrosis. And then eventually, the whole, uh, the leaves will die, the branch will die, and you will have die back. If we go to the next slide, you will see, again, is on elm, and you can see the marginal necrosis coming sometimes from the edges or from the top, and the yellow halo around it. This is on, uh, these symptoms are, they could be confused with chlorosis, as you see, these are no, this is on which elm, and they are no very uh, typical of what I mentioned just earlier on, the, the uh, marginal necrosis is more like a chlorosis, if we go to oak or no oak, you will have similar symptoms again. Similarly to olive or polygala, you can see sometimes this is on oak, how you have the necrosis like halfway to the leaf and then the yellow halo here. You can see it here as well. But in some cases, the necrosis will go completely down uh, or on, on the side. You have different Kerkus species where you can see the different symptoms. The symptoms always the same. Marginal necrosis, yellow halo are typical. This is on Kerkus rubra. Uh, hopefully you can see the picture now. On the left hand side you can see already the necrotic uh, uh, branches and foliage and the, the symptoms on the uh, right hand side picture. On Kerkus palustri, we'll have the same. You can see the uh, necrosis of the leaves and also the close-up symptoms. Here, the yellow halo is not that clear, uh, but as I said, it could be present or not. If we go to plain, Platanus occidentalis, and you can see the symptoms. Again, browning of the foliage, leaf scorch, um, and you can intuitively see the yellow halo, I think, in some of the leaves against the light there. We go to the next one. This is again on Platanus occidentalis. Uh, these are the, the symptoms. As you can see as well, all these photographs are taken from, they are from America. I put the reference there. I contacted the owners of these pictures just to use them because we don't have much information of symptoms on trees. This is the only, the only uh, pictures we could, we could find. This is on Asa, Asa Negundo, and you can see again the marginal necrosis. This is uh, on Asa, again necrosis of, of, of marginal necrosis of the leaves. more marginal necrosis. As I said, I can show you lots of photographs of marginal necrosis on trees. This is on liquid amber, the symptoms. Um, this is on Celtis uh, occidentalis, um, and you can see the marginal necrosis, and in some cases, like on the picture on your left, you can see the yellow halo, very clear there.
Jingo on Jingo Biloba, you, again, is the same symptoms. Um, then what I wanted to show you with these uh, slides is that on trees, what we know is from the experience they have in, in America in colder areas. The uh, Silella subspecies that is affecting these trees is subspecies multiplex. And this species, this subspecies has been found in, in France and in uh, Spain. Then I'm going just to go through the symptoms, and also this is just to reiterate how difficult it is to work with this disease. This bacterium can affect trees over many years. Symptoms may appear in one branch or in part of the crown. The leaves they can develop various patterns and of marginal necrosis, as we have seen, with or without the chlorotic yellow halo. These symptoms usually develop from midsummer and towards the autumn, as makes very difficult to distinguish these symptoms from senescence because we are going into the autumn. Then when you can observe the best symptoms of Silella is when you are coming into the autumn and obviously leaves are breaking, the color is breaking down on, on the leaves because of the autumn. Then symptoms, I can tell you, if you go out there now and you look to the oak trees, they all show this marginal necrosis with a yellow halo and it's not Silella but that is the normal discoloration going into the autumn colors. They may affect the reduction of, of growth and seed sets and flower abortion. Long affected trees eventually develop dieback, um, although other factors may be also responsible for this symptom. Infected trees are usually removed because of their appearance, because they look unhealthy or the, the potential health hazard not because of tree death. As I said, this is based on the experience in America. The most acceptable tree seems to be uh, elms, uh, but other affected trees eventually decline to the point where, as I said, dead branches may be pose a risk uh, uh, or they are unsightly and they are removed. The decline may occur quick or slow, depending on the tree species and the environment. Secondary pests or diseases may be present and responsible for some of the symptoms that, that we observe. Then I think my, my key message for, for what, what can we expect of Silella in this country is that we don't know. That is the answer. Um, many plants and species, as I said, are reported as host for Silella fastidiosa, and they never or will never express any symptoms. And that will make for us a very difficult job to try to find it. In addition, many host plants, the, in, in many host plants, the development of symptoms can occur months or years after the infection. Then by the time we detect the infection, maybe it has been already spread by the vector and we have been completely unaware. This is just some point to see, to highlight the difficulty of working with this pathogen and the vectors. And uh, this makes very difficult the, the detection uh, or, or the, yeah, finding it. Then, information available about Silella, you can find it. I get, I'm just uh, giving you here some links. We have it in our, you can go to our website. You have um, DEFRA, FERA, EFA, ECHO. We have a, a project called Ponte Project, ex actors as well, working on Silella. And they, they produce updates constantly. Then to be uh, keep updated with the information on Silella, I would recommend you to follow the links and see the latest. And in fact, we have received just, I think, half an hour before this meeting, another update that we are going to send you the links after this meeting. But on that update, they just said that they are great, it's a big concern because they have identified Silella on a wholesaler in Belgium on all these trees that they originated from Spain. Then, you know, you have to keep watching all the time what is new out there, and the list of hosts is always updated. Um, and I think it's everything from us. If you have any questions, I think we are all here to try to answer them. 
um, as I said, it's not an easy, <coughs> an easy pathogen uh, to work with, uh, as you can see. Um, and yes, we are open for questions. Can I just ask first, are, are copies of all those charts going to be available on your website? Yes, so the normally put on the the website. They're record, it's recording of the webinar, do you mean? Yes, yes, the charts you've just shown us in the last half an hour, because there's a lot yes. to take in. And I wondered if those charts were going to be available on the website. Yes, yeah, they will be, yes. Lovely, thank you. I'm so sorry, I'm going to have to go, so bye, thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you. I just wondered sorry. if there have been any other vectors identified. Um, if we've only got spittle bug, is there any reason why other um, insects could not be vectors? Um, there have been several vectors that have been identified as being potential um, vectors for the disease um, in Europe, um, some of which are also present in the UK. So, and some of them are actually more effective at um, being able to uh, pick the disease up than the me common meadow spittle bug. But at the moment, the common meadow spittle bug is the one which is causing the biggest problem in certainly in Italy, um, and it's the one which because it's the most common, is the one which is the highest risk. Thank you. It's also very common. It has a very broad um, host range. Um, so, it, it, you know, there, there's good evidence that that would be the most likely uh, vector because it's so highly common in this country. Are there certain plant species that are not being imported? I'm thinking particularly of olive trees. Anna, do you want to have a bash at that one? Uh, I mean, mainly I mean, plants imported here, are ornamentals. I mean, what we our big concern obviously is trade, and some of the yeah. ornamentals are the most common ones. Uh, and probably, I mean, we suspect that if it comes to this country, probably will be with uh, some of the ornamentals. Yeah. Lavender is one of the ones they are quite concerned. But you can see the list of the most. Um, uh, I mean, we have like a, a kind of a list of priorities big hosts, and in fact, I can, on, I can, it's, uh, yes, I think on the link uh, we are going to send to you, you can see the, which ones are, are these plants, but I said lavandula, lavanda is one of the main ones mm -hmm. that is expected to, 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 and we do import lavanda, the same with oleander, there are mm -hmm. these plants, you know, that we import, and uh, because obviously, we, I mean, you will be surprised, and we do import olives as well, because, yes. uh, yeah, and we haven't mentioned something here as well, but it's affecting coffee plants, for example, and mm -hmm. um, we are importing coffee plants as an ornamental, and this is a problem on coffee, then, you know, this is, if you think of this pathogen, it can affect such a, a range of hosts, um, from crops to ornamentals, from to grasses, then any kind of uh, yeah, any kind of in, import uh, from infected areas, uh, it could be potentially a risk. But as I said, polygala, oleander, um, lavender, this will be probably one of some of the main ones. Mm. The best thing is to follow the list of sorry. I think it's very difficult because unless you ban difficult. imports completely. Yes. Um, but the best thing is, as I said, there is a list of hosts, and I, on the links I provided uh, on the uh, slide, right. you, you, will, you can go there and it's updated regularly, and it's, you have a list of priority hosts that we are worried about. 